Okay, we on? Hi. How is everybody on this cloudy, rainy day? I'd like to talk to you this morning about Unity Temple. What it is, why we're here, what we do. You know, on Sunday morning we're at church and we gather together uh, in community and we learn and we're inspired and we converse with each other about all sorts of different things. But throughout the week there's about 70 different activities that take place. There's about 7,000 people a month that come through our doors and our purpose is <clears throat> we're a center for well-being. What that means is no matter who comes through the door, we have programs, we have resources, we have people that can do counseling, that can increase a person's sense of well-being. And that's varied. You know, for the homeless person on the street that comes in, his or her well-being is increased simply by a cup of hot soup or a sandwich. If that person feels down in their luck and they need something to bolster them up and get back into life, we have programs and resources to do that. For somebody else, they might have just lost a loved one, and they come in for grief counseling or healing. People go through divorces, and they come here, and their soul is crushed. They think life is over. But there's ways in which we can provide them with resources to increase their well-being. So I'm telling you this because the amazing thing about Unity Temple, the thing that, that I find the most precious of all, is that it's one of the few places I know where people can come with absolutely no restrictions. We have no racial divide, we have no religious divide, we have no social divide, we have no lifestyle divide. Every single person that comes in the door does so with a sense of freedom to determine how they want to live their lives, how they want to develop their spiritual life. We don't put demands on them to follow a particular creed. We don't put demands on them to contribute so much money. We don't put demands on them to do anything other than what they're guided to do in their inner heart. And for me, that's special because everybody is welcome. And everybody here is supported on your path that you choose to live the life you want to live. The only thing we ask is that you don't violate another person's God-given right to do the same. So a Center for Well-Being is universal. It covers everybody's needs. And we base it on several different principles. Unity has five basic principles that make up the theology. And the first one is there's one power and one presence in the universe. And you can call that power and presence whatever you want. That means that there's a spiritual overlay to everything that's within life and all around us. It's in this room. It's throughout the universe. It's spirit. Some people call it God. Some people call it universal mind. Some people call it higher power, whatever it might be. But it is the spirit of the universe from which all things come. It is impossible for me to define God for you. All I can say is God is it all. And God is in the Muslim, God is in the Jew, God is in the Christian, the Buddhist, the atheist. God is everywhere present. And the second principle is that God's spirit within us provides for us attributes. Spiritual attributes. That when we draw on and utilize them, it can make life a very easy stroll rather than a bumpy ride. We can use them in the most difficult of times when our back is to the wall and we're overcome with fear and anxiety and worry about what might happen. We can use them to draw out our inner good and express it into the world. But God's Spirit is in you providing for you everything you need to live a comfortable and fulfilling life. Now this comes into play when we go out into the world. We engage ourselves in different situations and circumstances and we define what those situations and circumstances mean. Quite simply, our thoughts, our belief system, creates our reality. For each and every one of us, when we were born into this world, our mind was like a very new computer that had never been programmed. As we grow up, our family, our parents, older siblings, begin to impress upon us certain notions. That this is the way things are, this is the way people are, this is the way life is, and we develop a belief system. By the time we're seven or eight years old, that belief system is what we look through to define what's happening in the world. And for each of us, it is different to a certain degree. 
If you're born in an environment that was very negative and you're constantly put down, you look at the world as a place that constantly reflects back to you the fact that you're not as good as you should be or that you have a sense of unworthiness to you. If you're raised in a religion that was very guilt and shame oriented, a religion that believed God sees all of humanity unworthy, a religion that says that you are unworthy in the eyes of God and therefore need to suffer through this lifetime, then that is the belief system you look through and you go about your life defining different things that happen as a reflection of your unworthiness. We define our lives step by step. Now the beautiful thing about it is many of the things in our belief system aren't true. They're not true at all. If anybody in here has the slightest degree of low self-esteem, that is an error thought. It is a, an illusion. It is not, there's no factual basis for it, whatever. And that, that holds true for whatever has happened in your past, whatever might happen in your future, whatever's going on in your life right now, this moment. You are perfect in every way. You're not the finished product, you're a student of life, you're not a graduate of life, but you are perfect in every way, you're a unique individual. There's never been anyone like you and there never will be. So the fourth principle is that we can change our belief system. If we have error thoughts that create a great deal of disruptance and disturbance in our lives, or if they cast a shadow on the, the self-esteem that we have, we can change those thoughts. It's very like reprogramming uh, a regular computer. If you get a new computer and you put in 2 plus 2 equals 5, and then you ask the computer how much is 2 plus 2, it's going to answer 5. That's the way it's been programmed. It's the same with us. We respond pretty much based on the way we've been programmed or the way we've reprogrammed ourselves. The best and most effective way to reprogram our belief system is through prayer and meditation. When we slow down the mind and we engage in deep breathing and we affirm the truth of our being that I am a good person, I am a special person, not better than anybody else, but I am fully capable of handling whatever life throws at me, then the mind accepts that as being true. So we can change our belief system and in doing so change the life experience we have. Now the fifth principle is a very easy one, that all of this stuff I just told you, there's one power and one presence in the universe, that spirit's within you providing attributes, you create your life through your thoughts, and you can change the belief system that you create your life through. That is all just fine. It's a nice little package. You can take and you can put it on the shelf, but it doesn't mean anything until you start to practice it in your life. If you take those principles outside the religious context, and say, these are principles I am going to practice, I'm going to exercise, you will see changes in your life for the, 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 the better, and you'll find yourself living a totally different existence. A lot of the stuff that you've carried through your life, and I'm speaking personally now, a lot of the stuff I've carried through my life, the heavy stuff that's dragging behind me that was diminishing the experience of life, suddenly began to disappear. It was left behind piece by piece as I practiced these principles. Now for a moment I would like to call Sandra Campbell out. She's our intern. Uh, been here two months. I think she's here for another ten months. She was on the board of directors. She's been in this, this um, particular spiritual community for 25 or 30 years. And a wonderful person. So presently she is uh, dedicating herself to uh, um, the youth. The teenagers specifically in developing spiritual programs for them. To tell you a little bit about Sandra, she worked for the FAA for how many years? 42. 42 years. And her job was, every time there was a plane accident anywhere in the country, her job was to go to the site, collect all the information, determine what happened, and she was a single voice that went out to the press. So everything you saw in the news was filtered through her, and she determined what exactly happened, so there weren't a lot of rumors going around. She is, uh, as I said, she's an intern here, but uh, can we have a couple chairs? I need to sit down. <laughs> Thank you. I stood for a while. And by the way, she had no idea I was going to do this until five minutes ago. That's why I've been standing up for a long time. Yes. Anyway, as a ministerial student, and as a, a student of life, 
with a wonderful, beautiful history of experience. Just tell me what these unity principles have done in your life as you practice them. Is there anything, anything that, that you can recall that really pulled you through and you wouldn't have made it if you wouldn't have had these principles to fall back on? Oh. I don't know if this is on, it is. Lots of experiences, I'll just pick one. A few weeks ago I spoke about uh, one of those and that was the death of my son. Um, my son was born into unity, that, that was my second child and uh, a woman saw me crying in the restroom at work and asked me if I would like to read a book that she had. Brought the book the next day. It was called Hidden Power for Human Problems by Frederick Bailey. This was 1972, and I read that book overnight. I was eight months pregnant with my son, going through a, a pretty rough marriage and eventually divorced from my first husband. And um, my, I, I really felt my son that wasn't born yet was leading me to this, because two years later, that son died very suddenly. And it was that experience that showed me that God is good in all cases. And that for every problem, there is always a solution. And if you trust and believe in God, you will come out on the other side better than you were before. And so I, I think that was the most telling experience that led me on the path that I'm on today. Well, that's, that sounds pretty incredible. Here you were, a single mother. I presume. Almost. Almost. And, <laughs> and your son dies? He died five days after Phil and I were married. He did, died five days after Phil and I oh, were married, my so second marriage. Your, your second marriage. Mm -hmm. so, so, so how do you get through something like that and continue to um, see the good in the world? I mean, it had to be excruciatingly painful. How, and I know you have deep faith, and you're a very trusting person, and, and we believe that God is good, life is good, but going through such a disastrous time, how could you ever rebound to the point where you're the person you are today? Did well, you ever get mad at God? Oh, yeah. Uh, for quite a while, I couldn't read the Bible or, or Daily Word or any of that, and it was very difficult uh, to get through. My strong foundation in faith, my strong faith in God was built many, many, many years before when I was just a little kid growing up in the Baptist church and not knowing or understanding what I was hearing or seeing. But later, as you become an adult, things become more clear. And that foundation is what got me through. My mother had lost a son about five years before I was born. And my father was in World War II. And they only allowed my father he was in the Red Ball Express. They lived in Louisiana, where my folks are from. And they only allowed him to come home long enough to bury my brother. My would have been brother, I wasn't born until five years later. So my mother became the pillar of strength for me, having had that experience. And, but most of the time, I was alone with my thoughts and wondering why God did this to me, which I think is a typical human experience or a human reaction when you have a life-changing experience. Let me ask you this, uh, wasn't your father killed also? My father was murdered on Christmas Eve in 1976 in yeah. Kansas City, Kansas. And um, when did your son die? 1974. Wow, so you had... December 1st, 1974. Two huge, um, um, horrendous events take place in a very short period of time, plus the divorce, which is difficult. For people in the audience who are going through a difficult time now, and they feel that their back might be to the wall, and they don't have hope, there's not a ray of light that things are going to turn around, what would you tell them? Oh, there's always hope. I think for everything that happens in your life, there's something good just waiting for you to open your eyes and see it. Someone said that for every door that closes, God opens a window. And most of the time, I think, when we are going through those dark nights of the soul, we feel that we can't see anything but that tragedy or that experience. It's the opening of the eyes, the opening of the heart, the prayer, the meditation, and it's a constant effort to keep your mind focused on what you know is true when what you're experiencing is the total opposite of what you know to be true. There's good in everything. There's good in every experience. Losing my son, and my father, and then experiencing cervical cancer just a few years after my father's death, 
<clears throat> helped me to open my eyes and see that there's so much good in the world, and there's so much good that we can do in the world. Why waste time on petty things? Use your gifts and talents, and I do. I'm going to use myself up. Because when you go through a life-changing experience, you realize how precious and valuable every moment of your life is. And I want to be a cheerleader for everyone who is going through any kind of experience in life. That's the one thing I can say, Duke, that having those experiences helped me with is compassion. I have this overwhelming, um, almost, I don't know what you'd call it, but crazy sense of compassion for people. It doesn't matter what they look like, where they come from. Uh, I just have this overwhelming sense of compassion. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons why you're an incredible benefit here at Unity Temple. We are a center for well-being, and when people come in, and I've seen them come in broken, and they, they spend time with you, uh, either for an hour or over weeks, and they begin to um, almost emerge um, as a, a different person. They're not hopeless anymore. They have a, a ray of hope, and, and they move forward. Now, one thing I'm interested in, uh, several years ago, uh, you began a study on a woman named Bessie Coleman. Mm -hmm. And Bessie was um, the first African-American uh, aviator in this country. In order to become that, um, the United States didn't license women. So she had to go to France. She had to learn French. She had to get her pilot's license there and then come back here. Is that correct? Well, actually, Bessie Coleman was the first African-American female to become a licensed pilot. And because we've just learned in recent years that there was a, an African-American man who got his license. Harriet Quimby was the first woman from the United States to get a pilot's license in the United States. Mm -hmm. But Bessie became the first woman or man, first person from the United States, to get an international pilot's license because she had to go to France to learn to fly. She had to learn French first. And, learn, and go to France and learn to fly, and then uh, get her license in France. So uh, obviously you studied her life, and, and you're very familiar with, with her character. Can you see any of the unity principles uh, displayed through her life? Oh, definitely. When I wrote the play, it was all about everything about my life that I've experienced. So um, I wrote the play one night after hearing that a school here in Kansas City needed a speaker the next day for Black History Month. And that was in 1996. So on February 4th, I wrote it. On February 5th, I appeared in a rented costume at the school with 40 pages of notes on a music stand. <laughs> <laughs> And so, so when I was writing the play, there, it, I had this overwhelming sense of kinship with her. Uh, this overwhelming, as I flipped through, through pages of a book called Queen Bess, I began to make some connections. And one of the connections was this spiritual feeling that Bessie Coleman was a very spiritual person. And how else could she have been able to have risen above such a humongous obstacle as very little education, no money, and traveled overseas. And I'm sure there were people in her family and friends who told her she was crazy. I'm sure you've heard that before. You go to Unity, you're probably crazy. But, you know, some people... <laughs> our people say anything like that if, they, if it's something they're not familiar with. And, and for her to want to be a flyer had to mean that she had something within her that compelled her to rise above what other people said. Mm -hmm. That's the power of God in you that will, no matter what others think or say, to you or about you, you know the truth about you is much different than that. It's better than that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that all the principles apply. And of course, when I wrote it, I wrote it with me in, with me in it. So definitely unity principles are throughout the play. That mm -hmm. God is everywhere present, even in France, in Paris, where she hardly knew the language. God would be there to meet her. And God was there with the, the men who trained with her and taught her to fly. And then God was here in this country with the people who were cheering her on and that she could rise above her circumstances, that her thoughts created her reality. She knew she could become a flyer even though others told her that it was impossible. Her thoughts created mm -hmm. her reality. Yeah. I can't imagine moving towards the obstacles that, that, that you say she met with um, and not turn around giving up. I, I mean, to have no money to have no education, to have a dream that everybody's telling you impossible. What gave her the, uh, the perseverance to just continue on? She must... Well, she was asked that question by a French reporter after she 
obtained her international pilot's license. They were trying to get her to stay in France because France didn't have the Jim Crow laws and they didn't have the racism and so they wanted her to stay there and, and they wanted her to be a poster child for the French. And she refused and one of the reporters asked her, how in the world did you persevere? And she had this statement, I refuse to take no for an answer. And so uh, that's the mantra on which I wrote the play. My mother used to say to me, don't take no for an answer. Every no brings you closer to a yes. Sounds very much like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> yes. Um, if you had uh, one thing that you'd want to um, tell the people here today, something that they can take into meditation, uh, what would it be? Know that the power of God is within you. Doesn't matter what your circumstances are, what burdens you may be carrying, you have the power within you to rise above any circumstances. Thank you very much. Let's take a moment to focus on that as we move into meditation. I invite you to take a deep breath and just slowly exhale. And just recollect the things that you've heard here today. That great spirit of Essie Coleman, the great spirit of Sandra Campbell, the great spirit that you see in all people is within you eager to provide you with whatever you need to pursue the life that you choose to live. There is one power and one presence in the universe. And that spirit is within you. It's in your heart as love. It's in your mind as wisdom. It's in your very being as the essence of life. And there is nothing that can prevent you from achieving a high state of well-being. There is nothing that can permanently hamper your peace of mind. There is no earthly situation or circumstance that can defeat you. You just continue to move forward one step at a time, one day at a time. And know that you're always on your way to a higher good.
Now as we rest in the silence, find that special place within you that has serenity, that has confidence, that has a sense of peace that passes all understanding. And know that no matter what has happened in the past or what this day will present, that you're always on your way to a higher good. The future is yours to create. And you create it as you choose in the silence. Now, ever so gently begin to come back to this time and this place. And as I speak these words, make them your own and say them to yourself. Peaceful mind, I am at peace with all the situations and circumstances in my life. Peaceful heart, I am at peace with all the people in my world. And peaceful spirit, I am at peace with myself and the existence I am living. I go forth this day with a peaceful mind, a peaceful heart, and a peaceful spirit. And so it is. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. We lift our hearts in praise Without a doubt we'll know We have been revived When we shall leave this place